Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about peer-to-peer -peer support services for mental and substance use disorders. Joining us in our panel today are Leah Harris, Communications and Development Coordinator, National Empowerment Center, Washington, D.C. Tom Hill, Director of Programs, Faces and Voices of Recovery, Washington, D.C. Michael D. Little, Forensic Advanced Certified Peer Specialist Coordinator, Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health, Intellectual Disability Services, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Monica Scott, Outreach Substance Abuse Counselor, Baltimore Substance Abuse Systems Incorporated, Baltimore, Maryland. Tom, peer-to-peer -peer services is an increasingly unique and an important part of a recovery-oriented system of care, of, of systems, whether municipal or state systems, that are looking to set up a recovery-oriented system of care. What is peer recovery support? Peer recovery support is, it involves people with lived experience of both addiction and or mental health and, uh, and, and in recovery. And it's using that lived experience as the, the fulcrum or le leverage to do the services. They're non-clinical, uh, they're strength-based, they, and they, they work on building trust with the person. And I would also say that they are also mutually reciprocal. So the person giving help also gets help in, in the equation. Very good. And Leah, uh, talk to me. I mean, uh, we have both the substance use disorder and the mental health uh, consumer recovery concepts uh, that we're going to be talking about today in the show. So tell me a little bit about, is there any difference in terms of recovery peer support between substance use disorders and those that are um, in uh, suffering mental illness? I'm sure there are differences depending on the context in which the services are offered, but typically the values system is extremely similar. The, the concepts that Tom mentioned earlier, this idea of self-determination and mutual support, and really recovering a life worth living, using that lived experience to help others and to gain a sense of um, empowerment over your own life and uh, so they're, they're very similar in that respect and and they can be the services can be very specific too if somebody expresses the desire to go back to school they can get help with that um, whatever kind of community supports they want to link up with all of these services and programs help to decrease isolation which is a really really fundamental concept in recovery is relationships and community Yes, it's building community and building relationships, absolutely. Michael, let's talk about um, the, the criminal justice system and how, how important is a recovery peer-to-peer -peer support system once that person is, is uh, leaving the syst one system and coming back to a community? Well, you know, um, during that reentry process, reentry starts um, when the person becomes incarcerated. You know, we have to be able to engage a person and try to motivate him while he's incarcerated, early in his incarceration. That way he start, his thought process starts to, you know, change. Um, and then being able to engage that particular person, is, it's just not just about um, peer support. Those correctional officers also have to be part of that peer you know, culture because they're spending 40 hours plus, you know, you know working with individuals. Um, having that forensic CPS in a person's life is monumental because, you know, it's, it's trust building. And also, um, as Tom had mentioned, that lived experience of incarceration. You know, a person knowing that, okay, I've been behind these walls and here I am outside of these walls now and I'm working and this is the kind of blueprint that I utilized, you know, um, for my recovery process also. Um, not to say that everybody's blueprint is going to work. But, you know, it's one of the things is just educating people and giving them a, a time, you know, for them to reflect on how they want to back, reenter back into society. And, Michael, were you in that system before and now you, you're out and, and you're working uh, with, with that community? Yes, I am. Um, I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, I'm a returning citizen. Um, and um, I also uh, spent time in um, a halfway house, you know, which I think halfway houses are monumental. 
um, as opposed to just being thrust back into society, you still need that structured environment, you know, to regain your own empowered, you know, self and identify what's going on in your life and how you can move forward. It's really about trying to find what's going to work for you in that process of incarceration. So, you know, incarceration is um, something that touches a lot of people's lives. A lot of families have somebody that's incarcerated. Absolutely. How did you determine that you wanted to become a peer uh, support uh, person? During my incarceration, um, I, I started taking some self-help groups. And um, once I started taking the self-help groups, you know, looking around at the room, um, I, I said, you know, I wanted to be, you know, become one of the facilitators of the groups um, because I still needed some more time myself in the, in the groups also. So I became a facilitator, um, and um, next thing I knew, um, I was in a therapeutic community, also facilitating in the therapeutic community, and just being able to assist the counselors and the therapists during that process, I felt that was something that I wanted to do. It engaged you. Once I was on the streets, yes. Very good. Uh, Monica, let's talk about what distinguishes peer recovery support from other approaches uh, it, that support people in recovery. Well, one of the major things that peer support does is it gets the individual who is being supported the opportunity to um, get shared life experiences from a person who has has sustained recovery or has had long-term recovery to be able to effectively transition back into society. A lot of times um, clients or what we call peers are more receptive to an individual who has been or traveled the path that they're attempting to travel. A lot of times the clinical aspect is great in, while they're in treatment. However, when the transition from moving from treatment to society happens, most individuals are kind of like not as receptive to clinicians trying to dictate or trying to assist with them transitioning back into society. So that's where the peer recovery advocate or the peer recovery coach comes in to be able to effectively share their experiences with them to say like, look, I've experienced what you're experiencing, the same anxieties, the same fears that you have, I've had, this is how I was able to transition from point A to point B. And they're a little bit more receptive because they understand that just because, um, I'm in treatment doesn't mean that I can't be successful mm -hmm. transitioning into society. So it's a little bit more, um, it allows the, the, the peer to be able to effectively move from one level to the other Very and good. know that they have somebody to support them. Excellent. Tom, let's continue on that note. If I was uh, uh, coming out from either a treatment program or a therapeutic community or even if I was in a mutual support group, but I felt that, you know, that one hour, even once a day or whatever, was not really connecting me. What would a peer support uh, program provide for me? Well, it's a good question. And first of all, uh, you know, we always tell peers they're not counselors, so they don't give advice, they don't diagnose, but they're also not 12-step sponsors. And I think that's an important distinction, um, uh, but a peer, to peer experience as someone's entering the community from whatever uh, treatment or institution, uh, the peer will help them have a soft landing and provide them with community resources, uh, so community generous. connection, well, housing, education, employment, uh, venues to that, maybe uh, it, it may be something like childcare. It, it could be instrumental, it could be emotional, it could be educational, or it could be what we call affiliational. So affiliation means connection to family, community, to other people that are in, a, in an organized recovery environment. And, and those things are really important if somebody feels like they're entering a community that's recovery friendly as opposed to recovery hostile. And and for a lot of folks that, that enter communities, they don't, communities don't understand recovery and don't really know how to support that. So that's a part of this larger recovery orientation that peers are a part of. And how has the, the system itself, the, the uh, recovery support system or the peer, now the peer-to-peer -peer support system changed over, the, over time, Tom? I know you, were, you started with the programs back in 1998 when SAMHSA right 
was able to put together the first uh, grant proposals that, that went out on the street for, for these services. Well, that was called the Recovery Community Support Program, which changed to the Recovery Community Services Program in 2001. So between 1998, there were advocacy grants that switched over to peer services, and the advocacy is still an important part of that. But, you know, SAMHSA had the, the foresight that, that, the, that if they harnessed the energy that was happening in the recovery community, they could sort of seed these organizations. So 15 years later, if you look across the country and you see uh, re recovery community leaders, many of them came out of that 1998 cohort that SAMHSA uh, you know, provided the, the funding and, and the resources for. Um, and so um, in that 15 year, year span, amazing things have happened. So um, RCSP, that's the name of what we call that grant. Some are direct descendants of that, but that's filtered out to lots and lots of communities that haven't had those grants, but have started that kind of organizing and those kind of peer services all across the country. So it's been very, very exciting. Very good. Leah, I want to hear from the uh, mental health community. How have the programs evolved? I believe they started back in 2005 or so? Yeah, I mean, this, this, you could say that there's been a movement of people um, really even since the early 70s who've been seeking to have, you know, for peers and people with lived experience to have more of a voice in the programs, policies, services, everything that affects them directly. So that's been growing slowly over time, but you know, now instead of being on the fringes or on the margins, we're much more represented at the tables in all of those areas that I mentioned, in helping to set policy, in helping to determine programs, in the delivery of services, there's been a move much more towards collaboration with uh, mental health professionals and people with lived experience. So it's that kind of spirit of collaboration that I think is really enriching the way in which mental health care is delivered. And it's increasing over time. And so the peer-to-peer, -peer, it's also very similar to the substance use disorder. As a matter of fact, I suspect that now both systems are, are, are dealing with the mental health. It also has co-occurring conditions, so you deal with, with substance use disorder as well as as the substance use disorders also has, uh, you know, people that suffer with co-occurring as well. But when we come back, we'll continue to talk about peer-to-peer -peer support. We'll be right back. Peers are a really important part of recovery, regardless of where you are. So uh, anytime you can relate to someone in, in the recovery process who has ex shared the same experiences, whether that's an experience in jail or an experience in the military, these are important um, uh, ways in which people can engage with each other. And the recovery process we learned a long time ago that um, people who experience, who share their own personal experiences are much more able to engage each other. They're much more e able to support each other in approaches to recovery. So especially for those who have experienced um, uh, jail or um, other kinds of criminal justice involvement, it's really important for them to be able to talk to someone else who's experienced that as well. Peer recovery is a very important Important, and both in the substance use uh, arena and in the uh, more psychologically oriented arena because people with lived experiences can uh, have a, a certain amount of authenticity that a professional without lived experiences might not have. The professional role tends to be more hierarchical by definition and it requires uh, a, a certain mode of interacting and people in need of services benefit from that. But they also benefit from somebody who has, quote, been there, done that, uh, who can recognize uh, when symptoms are arising. At times, the path to recovery from a mental and substance use disorder may be unclear. At times, the path may be rocky. At times, the path may be wandering. But laying a strong foundation with the support of others makes all the difference. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
early in my recovery, I learned two things. I learned the power of giving back and volunteerism and service, and I learned how that promoted my own recovery, and I also learned how to be a change agent, and that if I didn't like the way something was, that I had the empowerment to go ahead and, and, and try to make changes w with that. And um, when I first started working with peer services, those two things were essential ingredients in why peer services worked. Because uh, in the recovery community, in the addiction recovery community, um, folks are pretty well trained to give back and, and, and know the value of service and volunteerism. Uh, and also that, that if something needs changing, we have the experience of changing ourselves, and we've learned how to do that on a larger uh, scale. And Michael, I'm going to come back to you um, related to the justice system. Um, as we're trying to get the um, Affordable Care Act implemented, how is it that now we're going to incorporate some of these um, reintegration or uh, in community integration efforts into that whole ACA? Is that uh, plausible to say that that's going to be something that we're looking at right now? Well, you know, in the up and coming uh, future, um, having that Affordable Care Act is going to be monumental in the person's recovery process that is transitioning from uh, state correctional facilities as well as um, um, regular state mental hospitals. How so? Well, you know, if a person doesn't have um, health care, you know, oftentimes when you, you're going into treatment, you're going to need some kind of um, Medicaid or Medicare you know, to be able to be seen during this process. You know, um, we also know that several of the programs are closing, you know, because of um, the uh, lack of um, Medicaid and the resources for treatment. You know, treatment is one of the things that is, is an ongoing process and monumental in, in, in everyone's recovery process. And it's not just criminal justice involved. It's not just some people with mental health challenges. It's people around the America, you know, um, there's a lack of insurance, you know, to pay for, for care. Very good. Monica, you're an outreach coordinator. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you see both individuals that are in recovery and bring them to peer-to-peer -peer support? Um, and if so, you find me in the street, mm -hmm. I talk to you and I go, Monica, you know, I think I want to be able to do a, a program that provides me with peer support, then what happens? Um, what majority of the individuals that I see are on the street that are still actively using or that may n be in a recovery community or a transitional living setting that may need additional support um, such as? Such as there's an individual who says, uh, I'm a recluse. I really don't get along well with individuals. I'm, I'm kind of shy with going to the meetings. I don't really speak out or I don't know how to engage an individual um, for that type of support. So what happens is I would possibly link them with one of the peer recovery advocates to say this person kind of has the same similar story that you have and they're going to help to work with you to get you engaged in services, to get you um, acclimated with meeting new people and getting you the support that you need that you're not able to reach out and obtain yourself, but to help to bridge the gap between isolation and community involvement. So that individual would, you know, I would set up a meeting with that individual and the peer to be able to foster the initial connection and then allow the peer support coach or the peer mentor to be able to work independently with that individual to get them engaged, to be able to get them connected to whatever additional services they may need um, to be able to continue to foster long-term recovery. And Tom, let's talk about timing here. At what point should one who has uh, a substance use disorder problem or a mental health problem engage in a peer-to-peer -peer support? Is it before I go into treatment? Is it during my treatment? Or is it after I come out? Yes. 
Yes. There's not a bad, <laughs> there's never a bad time to engage somebody in the process. So it could be why somebody's waiting for a treatment slot. It could be to support their treatment experience. Mm -hmm. It could be a safe landing, like I said, after treatment, or it could be for the many folks that don't go to treatment. So it's a whole range of, of, of times when it's appropriate for, for peer work. And I think that uh, you know it's largely used as sort of stabilizing early recovery, but but it's determined by how long people need it. And for folks who have long-term recovery, uh, sometimes they may need, need peer support, but also giving that peer support is also a way to bolster their recovery. Michael, being able to engage a person at each one of those different levels is is key to that process because everybody's there's no cookie cutter approach to recovering. Um, I may I am I may have some questions, you know, later in my uh, treatment process, recovery process, that could have been answered early on if I had had some kind of peer support prior to me getting in a, at a certain situation in my life. I think that um, engaging a person at inception, you know, is 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 key. Um, I think it it'd be more beneficial to a person to be able to. Um, become feeling safe and comfortable around uh, someone who's going through that same particular process. Yeah, and, and a specific example that, that came to mind when people were talking was um, like the importance of having peers in, let's say, a psychiatric emergency mm -hmm. room, for example. I mean, what can often be a terrifying experience for someone who's already in emotional distress, that person can help them understand what's going to be happening, what, you know, find out what they need. Um, you know, inform them of their rights, all of these really important things that, that somebody would completely miss if they, you know, possibly if there wasn't a peer there to oh, that help makes out. absolute sense. Yeah. Monica, let me, let me go back to you and note um, that if, in fact, and, and Tom alluded to this, I still, I'm still using, mm -hmm. I can still go into a peer support program and say, for example, you know, I'm still an active user, uh, either alcohol, drugs, um, mm -hmm. but I want to find out more about where I can get help. Um, yes, w what usually takes place is that if I encounter someone at one of the peer support centers um, that is seeking treatment, one of the things that I try to do is I kind of try to start the process at that moment, um, even if it's myself being the peer recovery support person to that individual that they may not be initially ready to engage in treatment services, but let, letting them know that when you're available, when you're ready to be able to start the process, we call that the pre-contemplation or the contemplation phase of, of the uh, stages of change. And what happens is to let them know that I remember when I wasn't ready for treatment and people told me that this is what I needed or this is what I wanted, you know, that they were there to support me when I was ready to engage in services. So to let them know that if they have some type of contact information that I can call, they can call me or I can call them to say, hey, look, you know, how are you doing? You know, what's going on with you? You know, uh, if they have any type of medical conditions, have you been to the doctors lately? Have you been taking your medication? All of those kind of things are part of the peer support process to be able to let them know that not only do you need to recover from the drugs, but there are medical issues that you need to recover from as well. Very good. Tom, I'm going to ask the critical question. Michael talked about Medicaid, Medicare, coverage of services for health. If I walk into these peer-to-peer, -peer, am I going to have to pay you money? Well, I think that depends on the state. That, I mean, all of that's changing with the Affordable Care Act. So there's going to be opportunities for it to be reimbursed and paid for by a variety of, of government and private payers because the landscape's changing. Um, but I think for the most part, we've tried to build peer services so they're either very low cost or free. Mm -hmm. uh, I always say it's not the country club set we're serving here, it's folks who really need it and often don't have the health insurance yet, right now, or the money to pay for that. All that will change, but, um, but it's, it's the accessibility and the affordability that, that, that really make peer services, I think, uh, really engaging and really valuable. And Michael, if, if folks are referred to a, to, from the court system, they're, they're automatically covered and the units of care are taken care of? No, that's, that's, that's like, like Tom says, case by case. You know, benefits have to be cut on. 
Um, and one of the things is that, you know, I know guys that are transitioning um, that I deal with, you know, first thing they want to talk about is how do I get my benefits cut on? Um, this way they can get, you know, some money in their pockets, um, get to see the um, treatment people that they need to see um, on a continuum basis. Because, you know, it's really about, you know, continuity of care. You know, if we're getting um, services inside um, the walls, we need to be able to keep those things turned on and acclimated ASAP. And I want to come back and continue this conversation and touch on something that you just said. If I'm coming out of an institution, I may need housing services. So let's talk a little bit about that when we return. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Your path to recovery isn't like mine. You have your own struggles with mental health issues. Your own challenges with substance use disorders. You also have your own abilities and strengths. But when you need a hand, reach out until you find one. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The services that are offered here at Phoenix House, the Next Step program, include housing and case management. So the housing piece has to do with the, the people that are living here, the clients, supporting each other, holding each other accountable in their recovery. The case management aspect has to do with all of those pieces of someone's life that helps them move towards independence. So setting up recovery support services as they relate to support groups, AA or NA, um, sponsor, um, network, um, mental health, and medical needs as well. Next Step's really, really good at tying you in with all the services that you need. Being blind, I have to be sort of dependent on people, and it's, it's a custom setting. I mean, they basically find out what you want, and then the counselors at Next Step write up a service plan and make sure that you get in, char you get in contact with everybody you need, and it's really helped a lot. They helped me do my resume. They helped me find my housing. I benefited a lot from it. It's, it's, um, they, they put me through school. They pay for all my schooling because I'm in school. So they pay for all my schooling, all my books. You know, it's nice to know that there's someone you can go to to say, hey, look, I'm, I need help with something. Can you help me? And then be able to help you. That's a big, big stepping stone for me because I, I never was able to have people that would help me. Now people will come to bat for me all the time. And that's awesome. The Phoenix House, the Next Step program really does work. All the pieces that support recovery include employment, housing, um, benefits that you might need. Sometimes people need food stamps. So things that give you enough stable foundation that you don't find yourself what we call between a rock and a hard place where you turn to your substance. Um, and the peers are just a big part of that aspect. So you got the clinical piece that happens but then somebody needs to break that down for them and say, here's what this really means, and this is how you actually do this. The empathy that we have and the understanding that we have with a peer can, can allow them to come up and out of situations that they normally couldn't. Recovery doesn't start at 8 and end at 4.30. And for me, um, I'm a phone call away at any time. And for them to be able to pick up the phone and someone actually be there on the other end of it, and to help guide them through the process of recovery. It's instrumental to the recovery. You can get advice, you can get anything that you need from a group of people like this. Because they've all been through the same thing I've been through. And we're all here for one thing, and that's to get back on our feet and to move on. Hi. Hi, Lady Dawn. Lady Dawn. Lady Dawn. I think the whole goal of the next step is to take somebody who is struggling win pretty much every aspect in their life and get them back on their feet, get all their ducks in place, so to speak. And my job here is to be 
basically their assist assistant in getting that done. And that is such a rewarding feeling to know that somebody has done all of this and I've helped them become more independent and now they can really be supportive of themselves on their own once they leave. They need to understand that I go through the same thing that they go through. And it's okay. It's okay to feel bad. It's okay for, for you to wake up that day and not feel as good as you did the day before. And that's okay. And I'll be there for you. And in turn, they do the same for me. Um, when I'm going through tough times, the clients know that. And, and they'll call me, how you doing? You know, you teach them that it's okay to feel. It's okay. And the only way that you can do that is to show them that you feel too. Now that I'm in school, See my GED, I eventually want to go to school and be in some kind of peer support like you do. Okay. You know. Now that I've come through the pain and the anguish and on the other side, I've, I've grown because of it. Now it's like it's important to me to help someone else. It's important to me because helping you helps me. Helping someone else makes, makes me feel good and it's part of my recovery to help someone else keeps me right where I need to be. Because I learn from your experiences and you learn from mine. Leah, I'm coming back to you with the question of where does one house a peer-to-peer -peer services? What organizational settings are appropriate for peer-to-peer? -peer? It's so diverse. I mean, it can. There are um, peer support groups actually in um, public state hospitals. Um, that's one location. They are sometimes their own peer-run organizations, and the National Empowerment Center really highlights the work of these peer-run organizations that are um, creating their own services uh, through a mixture of they might receive some federal funding, some state funding, but operate relatively independently, so you might find those. You have a, a very exciting development called the Peer Crisis Respite, mm -hmm. which is um, almost like a home-like setting, it's a small, tastefully decorated house where people can come who are in crisis. They get round-the-clock support. Um, it's very informal. You kind of you can cook and eat together and come and go as you please and just get that support until you're ready to kind of come back to your your life as it was before the crisis. So that's a very exciting setting and these are just homes in communities, you know. Um, so that it really can run the gamut um, pretty much, like I said, from a state hospital institution mm -hmm. um, to these small home-like environments. Go ahead, Michael. Just piggybacking off that, that decreases hospitalization. Absolutely. So that decreases mm -hmm. also costs. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to see, you know, decrease of costs as well as hospitalization. And if a person in the community knows that I have a place of respite to go to and I don't have to go behind a wall, you know, that's less anxiety um, and less being overwhelmed that I can go into a place where I can feel warm and comfortable and um, have that just opportunity just to have like a safe haven. Absolutely. And let's talk about the housing. I wanted to come back uh, um, from the last panel to the whole issue of, of housing. How difficult is it to get housing for individuals that are leaving the, the justice system? Oftentimes, I know for myself, um, the men and women that I um, engage, uh, we, we, we are using the shelter system right now. Um, they have to, you know, go through an intake process and get properly placed. Be, you know, it depends on their actual offense. Some um, of the um, facilities who house the, the, the homeless um, don't take certain individuals because of certain offenses. So housing is something that is um, we're working on mm -hmm. as a system is working on. And it's definitely a, definitely a, a great need because there's not enough houses to um, realistically um, contain, you know, the epidemic of uh, housing, you know, for those who are incarcerated. And Tom, um, that hurt certainly holds true also for someone that has, uh, that's in recovery for substance use disorder, if, if a peer-to-peer -peer system is attempting to get them help with housing. I mean, I think there are more options such as Oxford houses right. and, and very successful, by the way. I mean, almost 80% of, of uh, sobriety rates and, and, and sustainment, you know, for individuals who are there. So talk to me a little bit more about well, that. Well, Oxford House is, has, you know, uh, 30 or more years of, of history in terms of uh, affordable 
recovery housing across the country. And now we also have the National Alliance of Recovery Residences, which is organizing other kinds of, of recovery housing. But the essential thing is... And what do they do, the National Alliance? They're developing standards and they're developing a network across the country that... Oh, that everyone who provides. Correct. Including Oxford Houses. I don't think they include Oxford Houses yet. I think they're parallel systems okay. right now. Um, the, 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 the important thing to sort of underline here is that for somebody in early recovery, there's two things that are, are unarguably essential, and it's housing and employment. Mm -hmm. And for folks with criminal justice history, um, there's, depending on the state, there's often barriers to those things. You can't get a job, you can't get housing. So how are you supposed to maintain and stabilize your recovery without those two essential ingredients? So not only do we have to like build these systems, but we have to lift the discriminatory, discriminatory barriers that are keeping people from accessing those essential resources. Monica. We also have um, what we call access to recovery, which are supportive housing programs that allows an individual coming from treatment, either long-term or short-term residential treatment, to be able to gain access to housing through um, federal funds to be able to pay for them for up to two months, to be able to give them that cushion um, that allows them not to stress about being able to, how am I, where am I gonna live? How am I gonna pay for you know where I live? And what that does is it, it eliminates some of the barriers and some of the stresses that are associated with exiting treatment um, that gives the individual the opportunity to save their money or apply for benefits or if they've already applied while in treatment or in um, some type of supportive services that allows them to be able to live free and clear of having to worry about how I'm going to live or where I'm going to live and that gives them the opportunity to get linked to peer support through the housing opportunities. Leah, I'm coming back to you. Let's ch change the subject a little bit or shift. Let's talk about how these peer-to-peer -peer programs help to promote uh, inclusion and social acceptance of individuals in recovery? Yeah, th this is a fantastic question. Um, there's a foremost stigma researcher named Patrick Corrigan, and he says that one of the best ways to reduce stigma and discrimination is to sort of hear the first person experiences and interact and see this person. So a lot of peers are very open and they, they speak out publicly about their experiences and, and they promote this idea that recovery is possible for everyone regardless even if you have a most the most severe mental health diagnosis you know we have scores of people who have completely rebuilt their lives so there's something so powerful about that that just sh you know sharing that hope promoting a message because so many people when they come into mental health systems um, just come away with these really kind of hopeless messages like this is going to be the way it is for you for the rest of your life just accept that you can't really dream big or achieve much you know and and this our peer recovery movement is just kind of completely blowing that out of the water and says no there's a life in the community that's possible Absolutely. for everyone can i add to that Absolutely. leah makes a really good point and it's you know we always say that Peer integrity and recovery values are essential in, re in peer recovery support services. And for that to happen, well, it means that the recovery community has to be involved in how these, how these happen. And there's two things that we stress, and one is leadership development, and one is participatory process. And participatory process means that the, the, the decisions for the program aren't made at the top. It involves everyone in the community in making those decisions. So program development, program implementation, program evaluation, peers are involved in every single level. So it's not just a, a service position our, our service role is it's, it's cut and pasted into a pre-existing workforce. This is real recovery-oriented systems of care involving the organized recovery community. And let me fill, fill, fill in with that also. Having that peer involved in that, it's a buy-in process. If I know that, you know, what I'm saying is being heard throughout the system, you know, I as a peer not only will work harder at that, but I'm going to be able to talk to my other peers that are in the program, you know, about certain situations. You know, to be an advocate, 
You know, there's always supposed to be an advocacy, an advocate board, and any type of program. So that way, peers kind of understand if we're having this kind of food, did, who decided that we had this kind of food? Did we have these kind of outings? Who decided we had these kind of outings? You know, it, it has to be, like you said, at the foundation. Complete engagement. Complete engagement. Excellent, excellent. Let's talk a little bit about, very briefly, because we have to go into break in a minute, but let's start a conversation about how we are training peer-to-peer, -peer, Tom. There's a lot of different trainings out there, and uh, basically, there, I, I would say it's, uh, most of them are 40 hours just for the initial training. Uh, peers are uh, trained in a variety of things like motivational interviewing, uh, so, that, so they get those engagement techniques. Uh, peer ethics, which are different than clinical ethics, roles and boundaries, um, how to do a recovery plan that the peer owns uh, that is very different from a treatment plan, some very basic things in terms of how people can use their life experience, but in a very, um, I would say, appropriate and authentic kind of way. Very good. Um, is that uh, something that also your empowerment center does? Uh, well, we don't uh, provide trainings specifically, um, but there are so many exciting... But you refer. We absolutely, and we really... Talk to us a, a little bit about what the, uh, the center does. Uh, well, the National Empowerment Center, we're one of three um, consumer survivor uh, technical assistance centers that are funded by SAMHSA. And we, one of the functions is to provide information, resources, referral. We have people calling us looking for recovery resources in their community. We connect them with uh, peer-run organizations, hopefully in their state. Um, and another thing we do is we help consumer state want state uh, sorry statewide consumer run programs to develop their advocacy and to develop their nonprofit skills and to just become stronger advocates within their states so or that's, public educators of that too yeah and it's I mean the functions run the gamut yeah but it's just basically you know providing the technical assistance to these groups to be the most effective advocates that they can in their states and Very that's good. that's a big piece of what we do and when we come back, I want to touch more on the peer-to-peer -peer coaching opportunities where people can get trained and become peer-to-peer -peer support folks. We'll be right back. Every day, I seek a positive direction for my life. Through my accomplishments. And now, with help. And support from my family and others, I own. I own. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join, Join the, the Voices, Voices for, for recovery. recovery. It's, it's worth it. it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The mission of the Penn North Recovery Center is to improve the quality of life, well-being of individuals and communities struggling to overcome substance abuse, poverty, homelessness, and crime, as well as health inequalities. After 20 years, we, we see on average uh, 400 people a day come into the building to partake in some form of service, whether that's our housing program, our GED program, our job readiness program, treatment, peer support, uh, or 12-step meetings. Penn North happens to be in the center, center of Baltimore City. Has a lot of history, because I'm a native Baltimorean. And what it means to me is I have the opportunity to come in one of the most historic communities and help it get better. The same community that a lot of things happen for me so that I can get better in my life. That's what this place means to me. The definition of peer recovery support, in my mind, starts from a basis of friendship. It's about credibility, a trusting relationship, mutually beneficial, where the helper and the person being helped 
both received therapeutic value. Well, peer support recovery services has helped me in the aspect of it gives me a one-on-one -on -one with someone who has come from where I come from. And I say that because of the, the very title of it, peer support. One of your peers are supporting you, somebody that's been where you've been, somebody that's done the things that you've done, seen what you've seen. And it's ironic because that was the purpose of me choosing to come here to this program was because of the individuals that were in place were individuals that I knew, individuals that I trusted, individuals that knew me intimately. This has to be something that's heartfelt something that's lived. It's not all about what I say, but watch how I live. I'm my best resource because I've been there. So a lot of times I don't have to go to a book to assist the recovery. It's all about what I already know. And that helps me to just make this thing even smooth. But being committed to this is a must. You have to have a heart for this. It's like having an extra person that's right there with you, that's going along with this process just as you are. Not to sidetrack or, or, or diminish the, the treatment experience that I went through, but being though I went through that experience, I understand better that I need somebody right here with me because I know I, I, I can't do this by myself, I need help. And I need someone that's gonna walk this walk with me and that's what peer support does. This place works so well for so many is because of the love and the spirit that's here, is the camaraderie. No one cares what your problem is. All they care about is what would you like for us to do to help you out. That's it. Tom, how engaged is Faces and Voices of Recovery in promoting peer-to-peer -peer training and what states are offering peer-to-peer -peer training right now? Well, Faces and Voices of Recovery, we have two, two initiatives right now. One is ARCO, which is the Association of Recovery Community Organizations. So we have uh, 85 members across the country, and we do capacity building and program development and leadership development with them. But we've also uh, developed something called CAPRIS, which is the Council on Accreditation of Peer Recovery Support Services. And <clears throat> we're building an accreditation system to accredit uh, recovery community organizations and other qualifying organizations that do peer services to, uh, if, if they pass standards that we've set through community and through uh, a, a lot of, of, of really hard work through committee work. And um, what types of standards? What are the they'd standards? They'd be organizational standards, they'd be practice standards, they would be uh, management standards, so that, it, so that any organization that got accredited would be fully uh, equipped to handle any kind of funding or any kind of, of, of development of peer recovery support services. And that means that they have to have the right level of staffing and the right referral points. And the right training of their staff and the right ethics development. So it's a really rigorous process for, for folks to go through, but if they go through it, uh, I, I can guarantee it that they're fully equipped to be able to, to sort of handle on any level, no, no matter where the, the services are offered, if they're offered in the emergency room, if they're offered in a treatment organization, but the recovery community organization is responsible and accountable. And responsive. Mm -hmm. Correct. Leah, is that going on also with the um, peer support services that you are familiar with? Yeah, I mean, at this point, there isn't sort of one standardized peer support specialist training. There are several different ones that happen. There's also more specialized trainings that people can get. Um, for example, the Hearing Voices Network. There's a Hearing Voices training to help people learn how to facilitate these groups, which are designed for people who have that experience to help one another and, and learn and discuss coping strategies and things like that. So that's an example of a very specific training uh, we also have one called Emotional CPR. Emotional CPR, very, very strong program. Talk to me about that. Emotional CPR is a program that's really been spreading around the country. It's very exciting, and, and it's, it's designed not just for peer providers, but really even for lay people, um, administrators, really anyone who sort of has the possibility of interacting with someone in emotional distress, family members, it can be useful for that. And it really is just a way, to, it's kind of a three-step process um, with the C is about connecting with the person and helping to meet them where they're at when they're in crisis. And then the, the P is sort of for empowering, which is helping that person to kind of regain a sense of control over their lives. And then the R is for revitalizing, which is helping to connect them with 
community, whatever, resources, all the things we've been talking about. But it's a, a training that um, we've been getting tons of requests for. And how long is the training, for example? Um, it varies. Um, it's usually, this one is about two days. There's a four-day um, train the trainer. Um, that's a, another exciting opportunity for people who want to go on to teach eCPR in their community. And Sometimes, where can they f folks find out how they can access a training program? Uh, well, you can visit our website, which is uh, www.emotional-cpr.org, and there's a whole list of upcoming trainings. We have a few coming up this fall and winter that are open for registration, so it's it's a great opportunity for folks. And, and to piggyback off that, um, in Philadelphia we're doing uh, mental health first aid. Um, and um, that was um, uh, a week uh, training. Um, they also have to train the trainers also. And you know, with that uh, mental health first aid, you know, th that particular um, public safety person acts as the Band-Aid until um, someone who is um, professionally licensed to give um, therapy, you know, gets involved in that particular person's life. Um, also, you know, SAMHSA did a, a train the trainer for trauma you know, and um, you know, one of the things is that you know, trauma affects different people in different ways. Same situation, but it'll affect you know another person lifelong in a different way. So those are some other trainings also that um, I think that are really you know uh, crucial in the development of a recovery oriented system of care. Very good, Tom. Um, recovery coaching is it similar to peer to peer? Recovery coaching is peer to peer if it's done by peers. Uh, it's similar to a peer support specialist in the mental health arena. It, it, it's usually one-on-one, -on -one and it's uh, you know it's a combination of a shared experience, role modeling, um, sort of accompanying somebody through the process of early recovery, and I and, I, and sometimes literally accompanying them. Like it may not just be going to the child welfare department or sending them to the child welfare department or to the community college. It's walking somebody through that process, which can sometimes be really intimidating yes. in early recovery. So having that, that guide or that, uh, that navigator along um, can be really, really beneficial. So depending on the system, depending on mm -hmm. the state, depending on the, on the uh, situation of where this person in recovery is, peer-to-peer uh, -peer can be named, ha have different labels, yes. uh, right. and so on and so forth. I wanna go back to Tom's note about Using the person that's participating in this group think uh, in a recovery support setting uh, as people that go out into the broader community and speak on behalf of the recovery movement and speak about the benefits of these programs. Why is that important? Well, you know, we still live in a society that stigmatizes and shames um, mental illness and addiction. And, and that carries over into people's recovery. So, you know, we're trying to train advocates to stand up and speak out to the community, to the greater community, but also to systems. To When we talk about recovery-oriented systems of care, you can't do it without people in recovery. You can't do it without the organized recovery community because where does recovery live? It lives where we live. It lives, it li lives in our hearts. It lives on our streets. It lives in our communities. And we bring that valuable experience to that whole ROSC recovery-oriented systems of care equation. And so that systems advocacy and that public education are still really vital and really, really important. Um, in Philadelphia, we have, um, with the Department of Behavioral Health, we have taken recovery to the streets, where a person in recovery actually goes out to a recovery house. You know, they may go out to um, uh, a recovery program, a day program, and talk about how a program has assisted them through their recovery process. That way kind of people can see a face and kind of afterwards ask questions, you know, that they may not ask, you know, the counselor because they feel more comfortable with someone that just has that lived experience. But having a person be able to go to a program and share their life experiences, you know, um, about programs, you know, how they got through programs, what, you know, they thought was good for them. Because it's all really talking about them keeping it on the eye because, you know, each program is not gonna work for each, per, each yeah. person the same way. And Leah, it's also teaching, not only doing what Michael is saying, but it's also teaching individuals in recovery to also speak to the different levels of governmental 
systems mm -hmm. and legislative systems mm -hmm. about the needs of individuals, correct? Absolutely, and I think one of the most exciting examples that I can give is the uh, suicide attempt survivors movement and how more and more, and that started as more of a family move, movement of people who've lost loved ones, but the suicide attempt survivors movement is now about bringing our voice to how suicide prevention is done, you know, in, in our society. Excellent. So. I want to go back and just very briefly touch on, you said that people need to get out there, people need to get the word out. Of course, National Recovery Month is a great uh, vehicle to do this. And, and Monica, I know that you are engaged in doing the recovery rally in, in Baltimore. Yeah. Why is it important to hold big rallies during Recovery Month? I feel like it's necessary for the community that you live in, the community that you reside in, to see how recovery individuals function, to celebrate the fact that these individuals have transitioned their lives from a state of dependence on drugs and alcohol to a state of independence of being able to be self-sustaining, be employed, be educated, and just to celebrate what is being done in your area to support individuals. Like we talked about earlier about the stigmas associated with recovery and, or people in that have had hit histories of addiction, but in celebrating their lives and celebrating their accomplishments, um, it's a task for an individual to stop using drugs and sustain their life after that. So I think it's very important to support those type of events to be able to show that your community is supportive of the effort and of what is the event that's taking place in Baltimore uh, for example as as an example of one of the events many thousands of events that take place in in the country during recovery month Baltimore has its seventh annual this year it's the seventh annual recovery rally run and walk and it's being held it's September the 14th at the Drude Hill Park um, in Drude Hill Park at the Sundial Pavilion. And what it is is we get together, we celebrate individuals, we have a walk or run around the reservoir and just have a good time, fun fellowship for everybody, not just for individuals in recovery, but their families, their children, everybody, people that support recovery as well as those who are in recovery. And that's a great example of what National Recovery Month is all about uh, each September. We celebrate National Recovery Month throughout the country, and it is events, not only rallies for recovery, but it can be as simple as a dinner at home of you celebrating a loved one's uh, recovery anniversary. Anything that one can do to celebrate recovery is absolutely welcome, not only in September, but throughout the year. And we encourage you to visit our website at www.recoverymonth.gov to get more information. Uh, it's been a great program. Thank you so Thank much you, for being you. here. Thank you. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.